All right, well, welcome everyone. I think we'll get started. Excuse my voice. Welcome everyone. I think we'll get started this morning. Welcome to Grand Rounds. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. John Spurtis to be speaking at Grand Rounds this morning. Dr. Spurtis is a cardiologist and the Lauer Missouri Endowed Chair and Professor of Medicine at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Uh, Dr. Spurtis did his undergraduate training at Tufts University and medical school at UCSF before coming here uh, for both his uh, residency in internal medicine at the University of Washington, as well as completing his cardiovascular disease fellowship here at the UW. He also stayed on um, to do a health services research fellowship at the Seattle VA, and then uh, went on to further training um, through the AHA with a cardiovascular health fellowship. Uh, sponsored by the American Heart Association. After completing training, Dr. Spurtis has gone on to become a professor of medicine at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. He also serves as the clinical director of outcomes research at St. Luke's Mid-America Heart Institute. Dr. Spurtis's research career has been both prolific and highly impactful. He has authored or co-authored more than 600 peer-reviewed uh, articles focusing on improving the quality of cardiovascular care, measuring healthcare quality, and measuring patient reported outcomes related to medical interventions. He created and validated the Seattle Angina Questionnaire and the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire, which are both two of the most widely used uh, clinical tools for assessing patient symptomatology and cardiovascular health. Um, as a result of his very impressive research career, he has been recognized with multiple awards and recognitions. Um, he has uh, received the AHA Quality of Care and Outcomes Research Lifetime Achievement Award, and he was also named one of the most influential scientists in the world by um, Thomson Reuters in 2014. In addition to his research, he serves as an expert on multiple national committees including chairing the ACC National Cardiovascular Data Registry Committee on Risk adjust Adjustment Models in Cardiovascular Disease. Today, Dr. Spurtis will be discussing an overview of patient-reported outcomes using the patient's voice in clinical trials, quality assessment, and clinical care. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Spurtis. So uh, thank you very much. Um, so there are a few of you who actually were my attendings when I was uh, a trainee here. And I got to say, I loved Seattle. I mean, this is, was some of the best. We were, my wife and I, who was also a resident, we met at UCSF, um, spent seven years here and just, oh, I guess I'm going to this mic, just loved it. And uh, uh, it's really exciting to be able to come back. And I'm giving um, medicine grand rounds today, and then I'm giving cardiology grand rounds tomorrow. And um, they're on different topics. Uh, the one tomorrow is more of what sort of most of our focus is on, but this is what, how I started. So when I came to, um, uh, Seattle, when I came to Seattle, uh, my first rotation was, um, at Providence, which I guess is now Swedish on the night float rotation. I don't know if that still happens here. And, you know, it was very interesting it, at UCS at the last month, what they do is all the students come together in a large classroom like this, and then they get the senior thought leaders in every discipline of medicine, pediatrics and surgery and whatever, talk about what's the next great thing that's going to happen. And um, the uh, cardiologist, a guy named Mel Chetland, who came in, and he had this clinical trial called uh, Timmy 2B. Does anybody here know what Timmy 2B was? Even the more senior people must. It was a randomized control trial of after thrombolytic therapy with streptokinase, uh, does doing angioplasty improve outcomes? And it showed no difference. And, uh, and so um, Mel Chetland says, uh, you know, we've been doing all these angioplasties, they're all gonna go away. We're not gonna do them anymore because they just don't really help patients. And here's the data to prove it. And so literally my first week in Seattle, I'm on night float. And on the second night, this 51-year-old African-American woman comes in with crushing chest pain, a big inferior STEMI, and um, uh, I give streptokinase. I'm very nervous. I mean, this is day two of internship, you know, and uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, she gets streptokinase and has 
a beautiful response. Pain goes away, gets this weak perfusion arrhythmia, ST segments come down. I mean, it was a success. And so I'm really happy. So I go off service, really very proud. I come back the next day and I check on her and I'm flabbergasted. They took her to the cath lab. And I'm like, why did they take her to the cath lab? And more importantly, they said, and she's scheduled for an angioplasty the next day. And I said, what happened? Now, you have to understand, I'm not, those of you who knew me when I was a resident would, would not find this surprising, but I'm not considered a wallflower, right? So, so what do I do on day three of my uh, internship is I, I print out from the library, I copy the Timmy 2 v trial. And I stalk the lady's room until uh, Dr. Sittman, the private cardiologist who's taking care of her, Providence comes by. And I say, Dr. Sittman, you know, I see you're planning to do angioplasty today on this woman. Uh, haven't you read the Timmy 2B trial? Why are you doing this? And he first says, where are you from? <laughs> and then he, says, he says, you know, John, it's a very good point. The problem with that trial is that they didn't look at the right outcomes because my patients feel much better with an open artery, and that's why I'm doing it. There's nothing I could say. I was like, wow, you know, we don't ever measure how patients are actually doing from their perspective. And so that ended up, you know, with uh, immense help from Rick Dale and Steve Finn and others, the opportunity to start thinking about how do you collect data from patients about how the disease is impacting them, and, you know, I've been on this road now for 25 years. It's finally starting to take off, actually, which is exciting. And so today, I really wanted to share with you sort of that journey. Uh, accordingly, I, I, I developed several uh, patient report outcome measures. Uh, so I am conflicted with this, and you should interpret all my, my um, comments today as somebody who's really passionate about having us more systematically get the patient's voice into how we provide care. And so my goals today are to just talk a little bit about the rationale for doing it, get a little bit in touch on the scientific requirements, and, and we have whole talks on this that I won't bore you with, but really get into the applications, a little bit on clinical research and some of the barriers, but where we're going in quality assessment, quality improvement, this is an active area, but really where I think we need to be going by integrating this into routine clinical practice and end with how I see this being the best way to translate evidence from trials into practice. And so, you know, if you think about stable, and, you know, by disclosure, I'm a cardiologist, so all of my examples are in cardiology. Uh, I apologize for those who don't care about the heart. Um, the, uh, so what do we try to do when we have patients with stable ischemic and heart disease? We either try and make them live longer by coming up with interventions that can prevent a heart attack or heart failure or death, or we're trying to make patients feel better. We try to improve their symptoms, their function, their quality of life. And that... That's what patients come to us for. That's what we do. That's sort of the core of our activities. And if you look at the knowledge base that we use to try and improve the outcomes for our patients, it comes from trials like this. Uh, I was just leaving Seattle when this was published. This is uh, the Gusto trial. It, was the it might still be one of the largest randomized trials ever done, certainly in cardiology. And what it showed unequivocally was that accelerated TPA resulted in a much lower rate of mortality than did other combinations of thrombolytic therapy. And this was wildly statistically significant, and, and I was impressed with this. I mean, I started using much more TPA than streptokinase. What's interesting when you look at this is what's the y-axis? The y-axis only goes to 12%. So let's put the same data on 100% scale we still have that highly statistically significant difference, but the question is, what happens to the other 90% of patients who don't die in a year? Are they doing really well, or are they doing very poorly? And if we don't systematically measure this, we have no way of knowing. And patients care an awful lot about their health status. This is a um, study I like to quote done by Eldrin Lewis when he was a fellow. So those of you who are residents and fellows, having impactful work need not take a huge amount of uh, um, sort of money to be able to launch. It takes a lot of passion and determination. And what he did as a fellow is he took, he was an advanced heart failure doc, he took 100 patients that went through his clinic, and they were sicker patients, and he gave them the time trade-off. And the time trade-off is basically a way of saying, if I could give you a pill today, 
and um, you had a, a 10 percent chance of dying instantly or a 90 percent chance of living I, i'm sorry the time that's the standard game but the time trade-off is uh, if you could live uh, uh, 10 years as you are today or nine years in perfect health would you choose to live in nine years in perfect health and if they say well i'd choose to live in nine years in perfect health then you you shuttle back to you know, what point of equivalence is. So how much time would somebody give up in order to be able to live in perfect health? And it's a, a, a way of trying to understand what percent of perfect is their current life. And this is the distribution that he found in his 100 patients. Uh, a lot of them would give up no time at all in order to be restored to perfect health. They had a great quality of life. But a quarter of the patients in this clinic would give over half of their remaining years if they could be restored to perfect health. Patients care a lot about feeling better. And so we need to figure out how to measure it. And that's what patient report outcome measures do. They are uh, a measurement of any aspects of a patient's health status that comes directly from the patient themselves. The Canadian Cardiovascular Society classification, the New York Heart Association classification, these do not count because these are the clinician trying to interpret how the patient's doing, not coming directly from the patient themselves. And there are several flavors of these PROs or PROMs as they're called. There's generic measures, the SF36, the EQ5D. They try and capture all of a patient's health on some scale, usually between zero and 100. And they're very good if you're gonna compare different diseases. Am I getting as much benefit from doing percutaneous aortic valves versus doing a liver transplant? You know, completely different treatments, big procedures, and you might want to compare apples to apples, so you might use a generic measure. But really, I think all the money is in disease-specific measures, because as a cardiologist, if I'm treating somebody's angina and not their arthritis, I want the measure to capture the improvement in their angina that my treatment is conferring rather than whether they still have knee pain when they go up a flight of stairs. And so these tend to be much more sensitive to clinical treatment benefit and they're much more interpretable to doctors because they're in ways we sort of think about a, a disease process. And if you want to think about sort of the conceptual model, and this is both from Wilson Cleary about how you measure health status or what health status even is, well, there's an underlying disease process, um, whether it's the atherosclerotic occlusion, it's abnormalities of vascular function, it's inflammation. And in fact, when I was a fellow, for the people who are sort of launching their careers, everybody told me I was nuts to go into PROs because this was the bastion of vascular inflammation and, and cell biology. And for me to be spending time creating a bunch of questionnaires for patients made no sense because I should really be studying some of these other areas. And, and this is incredibly important in figuring out what is the disease process and how might you be able to mediate or mitigate that. But patients have no idea what percent stenotic their artery is, how, what their ask, vascular inflammation markers show. What they're aware of are the symptoms of angina that they experience, how that angina limits them physically or doing social activities, and their quality of life is sort of a distinct concept. You know, given the same, the, the, the physical limitations and the symptoms that I have, how much worse is that than I would like to be? And you can imagine two people, you know, a 85-year-old um, widower who uh, has angina twice a week climbing uh, a flight of stairs, and his quality of life may be fabulous. Like, it doesn't bother him, he'll take the elevator. But a 41-year-old construction worker, she may need to do a lot more physical activity. She expects to have no physical limitations like that. So for the exact same angina and the exact same uh, physical limitations, her quality of life may be a whole lot worse. And so it's my thinking that you want to capture each of the domains separately, and collectively they refer to the range of health status outcomes. Developing a questionnaire is a bear, and I'm not going to go through all of this, but you know, uh, essentially you have to show that you're capturing the items patients care about and you're capturing in them well, so it corresponds to other things of those domains. So if you're measuring physical limitation, there should be some association between your scale and exercise duration on a treadmill or six minute walk test. It has to be reliable, meaning if the patient's condition doesn't change, the instrument gives you a very consistent score. 
And people often call these kinds of questionnaires soft data because they don't come from a machine. But the reality is that the intraclass correlation coefficient, the, the amount of reproducibility uh, within a patient compared to overall variability for the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire is about 0.92. Two cardiologists reading an angiogram have a simple correlation of about 0.54. The uh, same cardiologist reading the same angiogram six weeks apart has a correlation of 0 0.70. The fact that the data comes from the patient does not render it less reliable, less hard, less valuable than data that comes from some echocardiographic or uh, angiographic machine. Um, response in this is the opposite. You know, if the patient's change, conditions changes, can you the instrument capture that? Uh, interpretation is a huge deal. What does a score mean? And we've done a tremendous amount of work I won't touch on, and you have to have translations available. And, you know, when I was a, a resident here in 1992, uh, I wrote the Seattle Angela Questionnaire. That was my sort of fellowship project. And um, it basically came from going to talk to a lot of cardiologists. I went to Ward Kennedy and Pearson and a bunch of the greatest haired cardiologists I could find and said, what do you ask a patient in a good clinical visit for angina? And what do they ask? They ask, how limited are you because of your angina? Has it changed, which is the angina stability scale? How often are you having angina? Since there's so many ways to treat a patient, you know, are you satisfied with your current approach? And how does it impact your quality of life? And we went to a lot of patients. In fact, the treatment satisfaction scale came from a patient input. All these scales range from zero to 100, zero the worst, 100 the best. And uh, it's now been translated in about 94 languages. Uh, it's used all over the world because it's, it's proven to meet all of those scientific requirements. And it maps directly to each of these domains that we sort of talked about as being important to capture from the patient's experience. The Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire has actually taken off even more than the SAC has. So wherever I move, I label the questionnaire for that city. So when I was here, it was the Seattle Angela Questionnaire. I moved to Kansas City. It's the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire. And it, too, tries to map each of these domains. It has a um, summary score that is intended to sort of replicate the New York Heart Association class and an overall summary score. And, you know, these things are simple. I mean, you know, it, uh, when I tell my mom sort of what I do, you know, I am you know, came up with these questionnaires to, to try and figure out how patients are doing. She said, well, what have doctors been doing for the last 200 years, you know? <laughs> and, you know, this is the KCCQ12. I mean, this is just basically very simple questions that, you know, assess how limited are you in dressing yourself and walking uh, a block on level ground and hurrying or jogging as if to catch a bus. Uh, how often are you having symptoms of shortness of breath, fatigue, uh, edema, et cetera? Uh, how is it impacting your quality of life and how is it impacting your social things? These are not rocket science. The, the science to sort of understand how these mean and how to frame them and how to design them has taken a lot of time. And I and others have spent a lot of time proving the KCCQ works very well in HEPFREF. It works very well in valvular heart disease. It's been validated in HEPPEF. It's been validated in HOCOM. And this all makes sense because when you think about that health status domain slide I showed you, patients are not aware, aware of why they have the disease they have. They're aware of the symptoms and the limitations they experience because of that disease and how it impacts their quality of life. So how could we use these PROs? Well, clinical trials is a really important and underused but rapidly growing area where these PROs are starting to be used. Because if you think about the potential outcomes, well, certainly we'd love to affect mortality. The problem is that that's very rare. And, and you know, I mean, there's advanced oncology and other areas where mortality is the only outcome you, you really care about, I guess. But uh, in, in general, you know, that, that in cardiology, people are living longer. You know, we we are, we're, you know, and so we, we have to augment our outcomes with other events. So we add things like all-cause readmission or heart failure-specific hospitalization. But the problem with that is that's part of a process of care. There have been a lot of studies now. The exact same patient, you know, with class 3 heart failure managed in your pre-transplant clinic shows up at this ER 
you know, uh, uh, Dan Fishbein will get a call. He'll say, oh, just double their Lasix. I'll see him in clinic tomorrow. And the patient won't be admitted. But if they show up in Swedish, they will be admitted. If the exact same patient is going to have a different outcome depending on what ER they happen to show up, how good of that is how good is that of a clinical outcome to base a lot of our trials upon? We focus on EF, biomarkers, other things of that sort, and these are surrogates. Patients don't know what these things are. But PROs, describing symptoms, function, and quality of life, these are clinically meaningful outcomes. They're collected on everybody who's alive, or potentially can be, and they're the primary reason we treat patients in many, many states, settings. So there's this vision that the FDA would take a well-designed RCT, and you would be able to get approval by showing that there's a huge quality of life benefit from one treatment versus another. When in reality, there's this big brick wall that prevents this from occurring, and this is called the FDA Guidance of Patient Report Outcome Measures. And they have really, I think, created a, a uh, wall too high to climb to get the patient's voice in clinical trials, although we're working on it, as you'll see. But they have emphasized, with a lot of input from Don Patrick and others in Seattle, actually, the um, focus on content validity. Do you have well-documented uh, data showing that you know, you are collecting the, the domains and the concepts that patients most care about. And while that's very, very important, before this guidance were released in 2009, people didn't transcribe, document, and show and build these very complex mappings for patient interview data to questionnaire items. And we talked to lots of patients, but we didn't follow that. And it, it immediately invalidated all of the prior measures. They say that every population needs a different PRO. So if you're studying HEFREF, you know, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, that won't work in somebody with preserved ejection fraction. That, that won't work in somebody with aortic stenosis. These are all different diseases, and they need their own PROs. It, this makes no clinical sense, because as I talked about, the patients don't know why they feel the symptoms they feel. And if you have a different PRO for every different treatment, how are you going to be able to compare the relative benefits across populations? Um, it's very hard to interpret these. Like, what is a uh, seven-point difference in the KCCQ mean? And it takes years to be able to figure that out. And so to say you have to develop a new PRO for every disease, and then you have to tell us how to interpret it, it it's impossible to do. They say that, uh, you know, and, and all of this effort makes it very, very expensive to get a PRO available for FDA approval, and therefore the pharmaceutical companies are just not going to do it. It's, it. I mean, it takes, people have tried to create uh, competitive versions of the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire. I, I think that three different companies have spent one to three million dollars each trying to do it. I mean, it's a very expensive thing, and it's just not worth it because the FDA can always find something to criticize about it. But they have created a new approval process that we'll see if it allows finally for PROs to be certified by the FDA as an outcome measure. And we've been working on this on the Kansas City Carmiopathy Questionnaire. So we approached the drug device side, or the drug side, Cedars the drug side, in September of uh, 2015 with a 57 page, or 52 page um, submission packet of data supporting the KCCQ. Uh, they reviewed it, got back to us. We, they asked for more data on just two of the subscales. We sent in 194 pages. They reviewed it. They came back. We had to send 3,829 pages of data supporting the content validity and addressing their questions. They've um, had multiple internal meetings, and they just got back to me literally on Monday saying, you know, we think there might be some potential here. We need you to submit some more data. The device side's been easier, but you know, just yesterday uh, I finished another 57-page documentation on aspects of handling missing data. This is an incredibly onerous process, and it creates a barrier to include these in clinical trials, and that's a problem. I mean, because sometimes the only benefits that you can detect from a therapy, one that we use widely, are in PROs. So, Courage is a very famous randomized clinical trial of angioplasty versus, or stenting versus optimal medical therapy. There's absolutely no difference 
in terms of preventing a heart attack or survival. And the, um, uh, but in quality of life, there is a difference. Not collecting the quality of life prevents you from being able to really appreciate the therapy. And also, this is a very complex slide, I, I, I don't really want you to do, but this is comparing the difference or the benefits of angioplasty to come up with the number needed to treat based on your initial angina burden. And if you have daily or weekly angina, the number needed to treat from one patient to be better at a month is about seven, at a year it's about 14. It's similar if patients have monthly angina. But if patients are asymptomatic at the time of angioplasty, there is zero benefit. The, the number needed to treat is infinity. And so treating asymptomatic patients with angioplasty, when you know it doesn't affect survival or rehospitalization, makes no sense. On the other hand, treating patients who are symptomatic can provide a great deal of benefit. So quality assessment, quality improvement, this is a very interesting area. So PROs are in many ways ideal quality measures because they're very clinically interpretable. They're a direct measure of outcomes. You can risk adjust them if you need. And they're strongly associated with other clinical outcomes like survival, hospitalization, et cetera. But the challenge is that they've got to be integrated into routine care. And I, I'm going to come back to this a little bit later. But if you're going to have a PRO, you want this to be a byproduct of delivery care, not another unfunded mandate from Medicare to collect a questionnaire and submit it to Medicare. And I will argue and, and spend the last third of this talking about how much value it could have if we could start to integrate this into workflow. But we need strong incentives. And those strong incentives are now coming from Medicare. But to show you the need of, of these measures, why would you want a PRO-based quality metric? This is a study that was done by John Beltrami in uh, Australia. And I, I think it's a landmark study because what he did is he took uh, 207 primary care practices. He had them give the next 10 patients who came through their clinic uh, and had ischemic heart disease the Seattle Angina Questionnaire. And he divided the SAC into a very clinically interpretable framework. No angina, monthly angina, weekly angina, daily angina. And in these clinics, he said to the doctors, okay, we're giving the, this question to the patient. Tell me, is the patient optimally controlled and what's their Canadian Cardiovascular Society classification? And this is what he found across these 200 um, uh, in seven clinics. So what he did is he said, what proportion of the patients that they treat had daily or weekly angina, a SAC score below 60, right? So everybody here would say a patient coming into your clinic with daily or weekly angina, that's a lot of angina. I ought to do something about that, right? I ought to double their beta blocker. I ought to give them a calcium blocker. I ought to refer them to cardiology. I ought to think about angioplasty. I mean, that's an actual burden of angina in my mind. And, uh, and what you see is that there are about 10% of the clinics, not one of their patients had daily or weekly angina. There's another 10% of the clinics where over half their patients had daily or weekly angina. That kind of variability is extraordinary. This is why having the control of patients' angina or their symptoms as a measure of healthcare quality makes a lot of sense because had these patients even seen a cardiologist in the last year? The, you know, um, this looks at what did the doctor think the patient was optimally controlled and what proportion of the patients had uh, CCS class one, meaning no angina to speak of. And what you see is in patients reporting weekly angina, half the time the doctor thought they were perfectly controlled and a quarter of the time they said they had class one angina. When the patients had daily angina, 40% of the time, the doctor thought they were optimally controlled. Go tell Bill Lombardi that this patient with a chronic total occlusion and daily angina is optimally controlled. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. So, you know, Medicare is now going whole hog into this area. Uh, they, they've announced their intent to develop PRO-based measures. They contracted, this is the one with Mathematica, to look at uh, heart failure measures and how they're going to develop it. And essentially, if you want to get paid under Medicare and you want to get these kinds of quality, you have to start providing data that you're providing good quality of care. And so there's going to be testing this year of the Seattle Angina Questionnaire in stable angioplasty. And the heart failure one, I think Mathematica is working on, I, I don't know much about that one, 
But I think if by 2019, this is going to be part of care, and you already can get MIPS credit for collecting these PROs as part of uh, your electronic health record. So you could already be paid for Medicare by systematically collecting these data. Which brings us to why would you start, a, start collecting this in routine clinical care? So, you know, when I was uh, in medical school, I was always sort of amazed because, you know, first of all, there's a lot more sort of rheumatic heart disease, a lot of these vets, because I trained in San Francisco, there a lot of veterans had a lot of complex valvular pathology. And the gold standard for saying what the cardiac physiology was was the greatest hair doctor in the room putting on his stethoscope and declaring what was going on. Oh, this patient has AS and MR, and you can hear this Austin Flint murmur, and this and that and the other. And, you know, it resulted in sort of variable accuracy and reproducibility. I had some trouble always believing them. I'm sure they were always right, and I was always mesmerized by the whole thing. But, but the truth is, then along comes the evolution of the echo. And all of a sudden, the, the greatest hair doctor in the room is not necessarily right. I mean, he still can teach you to his mouth. There's still a lot of wisdom there. But, but you started to standardize the physical examination. And that led to a lot of changes in the way we deliver care. Similarly, assessing symptoms and uh, the impact of those symptoms is relying on the history. I think that giving these kinds of short questionnaires is an evolution, not because they are perfect. They clearly are not. I mean, every patient with chest pain does not have angina. You know, every patient with shortness of breath does not have heart failure. And a good clinician will take the time to uh, uh, sort of bear that out. And you want to celebrate that. On the other hand, I know for myself, if I'm, you know, post-call tired, I'm backlogged, I'm not, you know, one of the patients was really took a long time and I got to get through a lot of patients quickly, I'm not going to take a history on the next patient who walks through my clinic as well as I would take if I was ahead of schedule, well-rested, and had time. And what these questionnaires do is they ask the exact same question in the exact same way every single time they're administered. And it's really about sort of using these questionnaires to hear the patient's voice because we don't hear it very well. And, and it's critical to the way we deliver therapy. So I work on the Stable Ischemic Heart Disease Guidelines, a 240-page uh, document that nobody's read, although everybody cites. And the, the truth is that um, it all distills down to this. You know, you have a patient with stable coronary disease, you put them on optimal medical therapy, you uh, figure out are they at high risk for dying. If they're at high risk for dying, you send them to the cath lab, maybe they need bypass surgery, angioplasty, et cetera. If they're not at high risk dying, which is the vast majority, you understand, do they have symptoms? If they have symptoms, then you discuss whether or not those symptoms really bother them. If the symptoms don't bother them or they have no symptoms, you just continue with optimal medical therapy. And then the symptoms bother them, you send to the cath lab. It's very simple. Cardiology is easy. That's why I went into it. The, um, but the center point of this is accurately assessing patient symptoms, right? And so do doctors accurately estimate angina? We did a 24-center study of 1,250 patients where we wanted to compare the doctor and the clinician's report of angina frequency. And so we basically figured, okay, the patient in a clinic visit explains to the doctor how much angina they have. We'll collect that from the Seattle Angina Questionnaire. The doctor hears to the patient and figures out how much angina they have. So we asked the doctor directly, does this patient have daily, weekly, monthly, or no angina? And we looked at the concordance of this, right? I mean, it's a very simple study. And it turned out in this study that 68% of the time, two, now these are all cardiologist practices, right? So, so these are, this is what the guys do for a living. They're getting paid to assess the patient's angina, to manage the angina. Two thirds of the time, the patients had no angina, which makes sense. A quarter of the time, they had monthly angina. 8% of the time, they had more frequent daily or weekly angina. And so we looked and said, okay, in the patients with, who reported uh, no angina, so the patient reports no angina, how often did the doctor, which is the vertical bar, say they had no angina? And they said 93% of the time they had no angina. That's pretty darn good. When the doctor, when the patient said that they had uh, monthly angina, the doctor got it right 16% of the time. 
Now, now that doesn't bother me that much because if you have it once a month and the doctor said you had no angina, maybe that's not such a big deal. If you had it three times a month and the doctor called it weekly, maybe that's not such a big deal. But when the patients were having daily or weekly angina, while the doctors got it right two-thirds of the time, a quarter of the time they said they had no angina at all. Patient says, I have angina every day, uh, and the doctor says, no, they have no angina. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and I will say, I don't want to blame the doctors. I'm not trying to throw the doctors in the bus because when we first developed the KCCQ, um, one of the collaborators started using it in his clinic. He loved it. And he got somebody to build a little Scantron thing. And the way these questionnaires are lined up, the worse your function, the more you answer on the left side of the page, right? Because that's more severely limited, no limitations is on the right side of the page. And he used to describe this thing he called a shift to the left. The patient's not doing well. He would look at the scan card and he realized, oh gosh, she's not doing well. And um, they would have a shift to the left. That's what he called it. It's a different left shift than the hematologists talk about. But uh, <laughs> any event, the, um, uh, so Mrs. Jones comes into his clinic and, and he looks and she's got a big shift to the left. And he says, Mr. Jones, how are you doing? She goes, oh, I'm doing great, Dr. Porter. Oh, really? Are you having any symptoms or anything? No, 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 no. You're limited, you know, walking, climbing. Oh, no, Dr. Porter. No, Dr. Porter. Says, well, i got to ask you, you, you filled out this questionnaire, and it says you're sort of having shortness of breath a couple times a day. She goes, well, yeah, I am. And it says you get really tired, you know, almost every day. Yeah, I am. And, and that you have a lot of difficulty climbing a flight of stairs. Yeah. I says, well, why did you tell me that you were doing so well? She says, well, you're such a good doctor, and you're working so hard to take care of me. I didn't want you to feel bad. So, so I, I don't want to pretend like, you know, oh, the doctors are completely lame, and, and we need to ignore what they say. That's not the message at all. But we do have to realize that the concordance, whatever the reason between the doctor and the patient, is low at 0.48. And we looked at, you know, we figured old people would be under-recognized. We looked maybe women, maybe blacks. So we looked at what predicted the doctor saying the patient had less angina than the patient. And the most important factor by far turned out to be the doctor that saw the patient. That the exact same patient going to two random doctors in our study had a two-and-a-half-fold greater likelihood of being recognized at one doctor, under-recognized at one doctor versus another. And if you look at the doctors who saw 20 or more patients, what you see is some doctors never once under-recognized their patient's angina, and another doctor under-recognized it 85% of the time. I mean, some people take a good history and some do not. And what something like a routine use of a PRO does is it levels the playing field. Even if the doctor decides it's not angina, they could do it. And there are consequences to this. We looked at, okay, in the patients who had a lot of angina, what led to sort of intensifying treatment? And, you know, would we be more aggressive in treating younger patients and treating men, et cetera? The only thing that was associated with intensifying or escalating therapy was under recognition of angina. You were 90% less likely to intensify therapy or do another diagnostic test if you didn't recognize that the patient had bad angina, which makes sense. Duh, this is like when my mom just rolls her eyes. But it shows that it's really important to have an accurate assessment of how patients are doing in clinical care. And so what are the barriers to doing this? And, you know, I sort of wrote this editorial on the bowels to think about. You know, the first is actionability. And I didn't go into a lot of this, but you can sense that, look, this is very actionable data. I mean, if the patient is having a lot of angina, you're going to do something different than if they don't have angina. Now, that's different than uh, an SF36 and their role emotional score is low or their vitality score is suboptimal. I mean, I don't know what to do with that. But when you use disease-specific measures and you have something that's clinically actionable, like, gee, this patient with heart failure is a lot more short of breath, you're going to increase their diuretics. These tools should be efficient. You know, I gave the story of the busy clinician trying to get through clinic quickly. And if you walk into uh, uh, your clinic and you see that this patient with coronary disease is asymptomatic and they were asymptomatic the last time, then you're going to focus your visit in a way that is far more efficient than if you um, 
didn't have that knowledge. Or more importantly, if they were asymptomatic before and now they have weekly angina. You don't want to get in there and talk to them about their grandkids' high school graduation and how things are going at home and are they getting their statins and are they stopped smoking, all that. You're going to say, oh my gosh, is your angina, are you having more chest pain? And you're going to immediately hone in on the issue at, at, at uh, bay. So I think this is very important. Um, they have to be interpretable. And this is where the community developing PROs has failed to do an adequate job. And, you know, we've been working, we're, we're working with the University of Utah, with uh, Colorado, with Duke, with Harvard, trying to help the AHA Heart Failure Network integrate PROs into clinical care. And we need a scale. You know, when I was in medical school, nobody knew what an LDL of 170 versus 70 meant. I mean, we just didn't. I mean, now none of you don't have a visceral reaction that LDL 170 is high. I need to put them on a stent, maybe PCSK9s, right? I mean, you, it's a reflex. You don't even think about it because you know how to interpret that by paying a lot of attention to clinical trial data and other uh, epidemiologic information. We need to think about that for PROs. So maybe we need to take the 100 point scale and put it in a qualitative framework, like are they doing very poor to poor or are they doing good to excellent? Maybe we want to put it in the New York Heart class because we're all associated with that. And so we would have a different sort of benchmark for understanding that. Maybe you want to put it in association with the risk of death and hospitalization. But you could imagine at a clinic visit, under getting a patient score today and seeing what they were the last time you saw them and realize, wow, I am a great doctor. This patient's doing 20 points better. They really moved importantly in the right direction. And in Utah, the way that they're going to implement it, because that format they didn't like, which I'm really disappointed about, um, is this is their data. So they've used the same labels on the y-axis, but they like looking at time series graphs. And so you see a patient uh, on August uh, 12th, you'd see him two months ago, you tried to intensify their uh, ACE inhibitors and, and their diuretics, and they're really not doing that well. And so you'll say, well, gee, you know, there's minimal improvement with this medical therapy. We talked about CRT. Let's put in a CRT device. And, and you follow them the next time, and there's a large further improvement with CRT that's actually associated, a, a change of this magnitude lowers that patient's risk of death and rehospitalization over the next year by about 52%. But they're still at 70. Can you get them to 100? Should you optimize the settings on the CRT device? It's giving you a barometer of how your treatments are impacting your patients. It's the infrastructure for end of one trials. I mean, it's a really exciting thing. And if you think about every clinic visit, what do you do with heart failure? You say, well, we're gonna try and tweak this. And I see, we'll see how you're doing in two months when you've tried these medicines for a while. Well, what if you went in and this is what they're doing at Utah, they say, here's your KCCQ score today. We're going to start this medicine. We're going to have you repeat it in two months, and we'll see if you're doing better or not. And if you're doing better, great. If you're doing worse, we'll stop it and try something else. It co-ops the patient to be a partner in their management to understand why you're treating them. And I think it's really uh, uh, exciting. Um, you know, they have to be obligatory. Medicare is really helping us because none of us want to add anything to our workload. Our IT departments are backed up for way too many years to be able to think about integrating something like this. Uh, you know, it's, it, but if Medicare says it must be done, so may it come to pass. And they've got to be user friendly. You know, some of the early PROs are 36, 126 items. That's just not going to fly. So, you know, we shrunk the Seattle Lanch questionnaire from when we first did it to seven items. Uh, we cut the KCCQ to 12, as I showed you, but there are still barriers. I mean, you still have to get the data from the patient into the provider, and that requires a lot of creative effort. And whether that's going to be through my chart that most patients don't use, whether people are going to develop little app-based tools, or you're going to give iPads in clinic to do it, we have to figure out how to do that so that it's routinely on the opening page of your Cerner or Epic system, and you can start to access and use it readily. Finally, uh, I, I just want to end with where I think the future of going, is going in PROs beyond sort of what I've talked about now. And, you know, in quality of care, we often realize that there's a variation in how care is delivered. And good care in quality improvement is about shifting the performance to better care and narrowing the variation across doctors, right? And so the idea is that 
when you have a performance measure like uh, aspirin within 24 hours of a heart attack, if you narrow the variation across doctors after your intervention, you've done better. That's quality improvement. On the other hand, when treatment is reflective of patients' preferences and not physicians' preferences, then you want more variation because some patients will value different outcomes differently and you want to honor their values. And so you have to come up with a way to give them what the likely trade-offs they are thinking about. And so I like to, we've done a lot of work with uh, uh, CRT. So this is a cardiac resynchronization therapy, patients with a heart, bad heart failure and a wide QRS, you put in two leads, one in the right ventricle, one in the left ventricle, you alternate the depolarization so that the QRS sort of narrows and the ventricles squeeze in synchrony. And what should be happening is that the patient should learn from the doctor, you are a potential candidate for this therapy. And the patient would say, well, these are the things that are important to me, survival, symptoms, you know, avoiding risks, getting to my you know, high, uh, uh, grandson's high school graduation. And together, they participate in shared decision making. The problem is that patients care a lot about their symptoms, function, and quality of life. And doctors have no idea how to explain to patients how they will benefit from one therapy or another. And that's because the source of our data, our knowledge, comes from clinical trials where we give some tested intervention like CRT to a whole population of patients. Some do really well, some do really poorly, and we report in the New England Journal the average benefit across the population. And, you know, what are our guidelines but a summary of the summaries of experiences by reviewing all the different publications in the New England Journal and JAM and whatever. And what this graphic makes incredibly clear is that there is no patient that was treated that actually has a green head, a yellow body, and red legs, right? What we need to be doing is risk stratifying our patients. We need to create tools that can tell us from these clinical trial results how will Mrs. Jones or Mr. Atkinson do with these different therapies. And so we actually they use the Minnesota Living with Heart Failure questionnaire, but these are five trials of CRT therapy. And they all, lower scores on this instrument are better. And when you look across all five studies, there is a 3.6 point difference in Minnesota Living with Heart Failure Questionnaire. What does that mean? I can tell you that a six and a half point difference is clinically important. So this is a, on average about half of a clinically important difference in this questionnaire. How are you gonna apply that to these two patients, right? I mean, here are two patients that could show up in your clinic, one right after the other, both technically eligible for CRT, which one is going to benefit? Well, so we model, it turns out this, uh, although there's a lot of lines here, there's a lot of interactions, this looks really complicated. The truth is, all you need to predict benefit from CRT in terms of quality of life outcomes is the age of the patient, the width of their QRS, and their baseline quality of life. And from that, you could build tools like this. Imagine now talking to those two patients and saying on the first page, this is what the treatment is. It's a device that goes into the heart to coordinate the ventricular contractions. From the ACC NCDR registry, we know you have a 4.4% chance of a major complication of this procedure. That's the risk you take of getting this in. But there's a small survival advantage at one year. That comes from a model published in the European Heart Journal. But if you get this, then your likelihood of feeling a whole lot better with CRT is almost 50% compared to about 30% without CRT. So a third of the patients who don't get CRT feel a whole lot better in a year or three months, and um, uh, uh, half the patients with CRT get it. That's an NNT of five. Here's your likelihood of feeling worse three months from now with or without CRT. And with CRT, it's a lot lower than without. And then you can give them you know, information about you know, setting off the TSA alarms and all of that sort of stuff. But this is the kind of shared decision making we should be striving for, really using the evidence from our clinical trials to inform an individual patient about how they're likely to do and recognizing that the PROs are a very important component of giving them the information they need to make a decision. So I'm going to end here. I think PROs have evolved an awful lot. It's, it's 
funny, this is my fellowship project. I can now come 20 years later, 25 years later, and say we're still only a fraction of the way to the promised land, but I still think a lot of progress has been made. We really started to develop these measures, understanding how to use them. Uh, despite their roles in clinical trials and outcomes research, we have not yet really integrated them into clinical care. That's just starting. I think it's incredibly important. I think it's incredibly promising. Um, and, you know, fortunately, this is going to happen whether we want to or not, fortunately from my perspective, wanting the patient's voice in our care, because Medicare is going to start to demand it. But in the future, we and you, as you work here, can start to develop the models of the heterogeneity of treatment benefit and build the tools that I think are needed to really create and enable patient-centered care, focusing on the symptoms, function, and quality of life of our patients. Thank you very much. I'd love to take any questions you might have. Hi, great talk, and um, I'm a big fan of the Seattle Angina Questionnaire. Um, Thank you. What about people who have limited literacy, limited health literacy? How do you integrate a questionnaire for people who can't really read? So we, uh, so first of all, um, th that's an important issue, actually. It's, it's written uh, sort of between the, uh, we try to get out of the sixth grade level. It's, it's sort of about the ninth grade level, uh, uh, so it's a little higher than you would like. Um, you know, I think you read it to them. I mean, I think you, you, you know, we've done a lot of uh, work trying to compare interview versus self-administered versus uh, um, uh, the internet. When the internet was very brand new, we tried to see would that work uh, as a vehicle for collecting these data. And I've often found them to be exceedingly comparable with very, very little variability. And so I, I'm not a big stickler. I mean, I think if Don Patrick was here, he would say very different, you know, he had a very different opinion about how important it is to administer it exactly in this way, in a quiet room with no distractions, with this, just like the way blood pressure was measured in the sprint trial. Never happens in the real world. And I think the noise introduced by the different methods of administration is dwarfed by the variability across patients. And so I have not found it to be a huge issue. This isn't being recorded anywhere, is it? <laughs> yeah. um, and on a similar vein, what is being done to work on like culturally competent or culturally relevant um, versions of these PRO surveys for different languages and different kind of cultural so, views of their health? So, so that's a very interesting question. So it turns out that um, I don't want to call it a racket, but there is a very subspecialized skill that translates these measures into different languages and different cultures, and. Uh, I alluded to sort of the 90, 95 versions of the SAC and the KCCQ that exist. Um, you know, what they do is they have two forward translations, then there's a reconciliation, then there's a, uh, a, a feedback from the provider, then there's a back translation, then it's field tested with patients and with clinicians for feedback. And that process costs about, I mean, the prices come down, but, but you know, roughly $15,000 a questionnaire. When I, uh, I once wrote a, a check to Moppy to translate the KCCQ, this was a decade ago before there's a lot of competition in the space, it was $38,000 to translate the KCCQ into Japanese. And so for that much money, they better darn well be doing a good job making sure that they've got the appropriate cultural, literate, uh, uh, linguistical and cultural interpretations. And there are like 17 different versions of English. It's different in Australia than it is in England, than it is in Ireland, than it is in Canada, than it is in the U.S. I mean, I, I don't know. I look at it, it all looks like English to me. But there's a lot of, uh, lot of attention paid to making sure that this is culturally relevant and linguistically appropriate for different languages, and even different languages, the same language in different countries. Yeah, here. So, yeah, it was a really in inspiring talk. I, I, I imagine there must be some data uh, testing this as an intervention. Um, you, maybe I missed it, but you know, randomizing practices to either PRO or not and seeing whether there was an impact on what you consider to be important outcomes. So, so it's a great question. So, so uh, it turns out that 
part of what led the CRS question to be built was Steve Finn had a big grant of doing just that at the VA with a broad range of, of uh, health status measures, emphasizing primarily the SF36 and a few disease-specific measures. And uh, he was way ahead of the curve. I mean, he built these for you know COPD, for hypertension, for for uh, coronary disease, which was the Seattle Answer Questionnaire. Um, you know, we didn't know enough to, to convert the data and the scores into clinically interpretable framework. And and I think that it did not work in that study. And um, and I think that it requires framing these scores into uh, an actionable and readily accessible an interpretable way of delivering care. And um, I, we're starting to do that with heart failure. I wish I could do that more with the Seattle Angina questionnaire because I think angina, daily, weekly, monthly, no angina is the easiest of all the scales to interpret uh, clearly and to have clear actionability to it. So that work needs to be done. It's very important to do. Uh, we're, um, you can only do so much, but we're very eager to get involved in that work and we're helping Utah, but they're not randomizing. They're still working in the methods. And I think once we figure out there how to get it done, we probably will come around to putting in a, a cluster randomized trial to try to do that. And whether that's self-funded or whether that's NIH funded, you know, most of our grants have been NIH funded, but that process is too slow. We need to start figuring this out right away. And large healthcare delivery networks have a perfect vehicle and infrastructure for testing this faster and for refining it and continually iteratively improving it. And so, uh, uh, and now with technology to get them the results in the workflow, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity and it still needs to be done. It's incompletely tested so far. That was a great talk. You mentioned sort of the role of expectations for patients and they might be different for different patients. I wonder if you could comment a little bit more on that in terms of the patient reported outcomes and how that might play a role and maybe even in a randomized trial. So I'm not totally sure what you mean by expectations. You had mentioned that a patient who is 41 and is a construction worker may mm. have a very different level of expectation for what their oh, oh, okay. is going to be versus an 84 year old. So, so, so it's a very, so, so it's a, it's a very good question. So, first of all, that example that I made, what you would end up seeing is, you know, on the Seattle Answer Questionnaire, there are different domains, and you'd see between the two patients very similar. Um, angina frequency scores, physical limitation scores, but very different quality of life scores. And to me, what, when, as a clinician, I don't have these slides up there, but when I was teaching uh, Utah how I would interpret the KCCQ, you sort of start at a high level, and if they're doing really well, you're sort of done, and you're gonna go to other healthcare issues. If they're doing poorly, then you wanna figure out why, what's causing them to do poorly. And in those examples, what you click quickly realize is that yes, this woman has some angina, and yes, it's limiting her a bit, but her quality of life is a lot lower than I would expect, and then you would start to address that. You would talk to her about depression. You would talk to her about um, participating in rehab and getting more sort of social support for doing this. You know, you might think about doing a more aggressive approach like angioplasty, even though she has monthly angina, you may decide that given the decrement that's having on her quality of life, she'll get more benefit from that angioplasty procedure. So it's a way of doing it. Now the other, I, I can always make your question more difficult, which is what about adaptation? You know, people just adopt, you know? So, uh, you know, a uh, percutaneous auric valve is a big deal. A lot of these 90 year old patients have had symptoms and limitations for so long, they call it the aging process and their quality of life score may be better than it really would be if this was all acutely happening to them because they've adapted over time. We don't really have a solution to that. I mean, it, it's, um, uh, you know, it's recognition as a potential problem and something to think about is very, very important. And, and in that case, you would end up reacting more to the symptom burden the patient had than the uh, quality of life impact it had on them in deciding what the best course was because it's very common that patients will say, I had no idea I could feel this good after treatment. And, and you know, that's an inherent limitation of using the patient. If they can't imagine feeling this good, how could they realize that they're not doing as well as they thought? And if they're an optimistic person, they'll score higher than another person with similar burden would. I think that's all the time we have. Thank you very much, Dr. Spertus.